Smell that chili. Is it almost done? I think so. Oh, I'm so hungry. I can't wait to eat. Oh, it looks pretty hot. Oh, it's too hot to eat! We oh, what a mess. mess. Well, hey, boys and girls, Spilly Chili here is sitting in front of this big empty stage tonight because the band didn't show up. That's right. They canceled at the last minute, had something else going on, and they said, oh, well, can't you just reschedule me? And I said, no. That's how it goes here. And the band that was supposed to be on tonight uh, that we recorded two weeks ago were so horrible that I just, I'm not even going to bother with it. You know, it's just so bad. They showed up late. They did three songs. I had to kick them out. And so instead of that crap, you know what I got for you? Some really cool stuff, folks. Tonight I'm going to go way back again. I got a lot of response when I did this a few weeks ago. And I'm going to do it again. Santa Cruz back in the mid 80s had an incredible band called Eddie and the Tide. And I had the great pleasure and privilege to be able to work with those guys for a few years during their heyday. I came on board right when their solo independent album came out and it was selling like blockbusters. In fact, I used to work at a warehouse record stores back in Mountain View and that was one of our biggest selling albums. And because it was an independent album, we couldn't get them very easily. And uh, gosh, I don't know how many people were disappointed that I couldn't sell them that album. And a couple uh, months later, I had a chance to work with them in Novato on a one-off chance and didn't think much of it and didn't think much of them and uh, just you know, kind of went on my way. And it wasn't more than, uh, shit, about a month later, I get a phone call and it's their road manager asking me if I'd like to do lighting for them for uh, some big shows, one at the Concord Pavilion and uh, one at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds during the fair uh, many years ago. I think that was 85, maybe 84 even. And I said, oh, hell, sure, you know, you guys are going to pay me. i do anything for money, as you guys know. And I went out there, and the first show was at the Santa Cruz Fairgrounds, which uh, is a place I've worked with many times. And, uh, you know, we had a pretty good night that night. And then my second night was at the Concord Pavilion. And, uh, man, that was a great night. And uh, things went real well, and I got on the crew, and I started traveling around with them. And not more than two months after that, Atlantic Records comes along and signs them. And it was a great day for all of us. I mean, we were just all so stoked, and they took us into Fantasy Studios up in Berkeley, and we recorded that first album, and uh, it was a great time. And so the first video that came off that album, which was actually a song on their... Um, first independent album also was a song called One in a Million. And we recorded most of that here in Santa Cruz. I think you'll see that. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about it after we watch this clip. So Dave, if you could roll that first clip for us, that'd be great. All right. As manager of this hotel, I've been nice enough to let you play as Eddie Natai this summer. And so far, it hasn't interfered with your regular jobs here. With these record executives coming, I don't want you guys trying to get a record deal while you play poolside. And I don't want any horsing around. And especially this weekend, I don't want you even talking to the record executives at all. Scott, eyes on the pool, not on the ladies. Johnny, guests do not carry their own bags. Kaz, park the cars, don't sleep in them. George, don't mix up the room keys today. Eddie, a good waiter can make lots of money. So give up the nonsense with the tight end record deal. You're dreaming. Your chance to get in sign are one in a million. Mr. C, this band is one in a million.
Isn't that cool, folks? So that was one in a million, and um, yours truly here did the lighting for that. That concert scene was done at the Keystone Palo Alto. Bob Corona, the owner of the Keystones, was the hotel guy at the beginning telling the boys that they better work hard. And anyway, we did that show at the Keystone Palo Alto, and you think this stuff's all a bunch of fun and stuff. Well, we got there at 2 o'clock in the morning when the show before ended, had to load all that lighting gear into the place, got ready to start at about 5.30, and the electrician blew up the power panel. And we had to wait till the Ace Hardware store opened at 8 o'clock so we could get the replacement parts. Of course, all the camera people and video crew were there, as pissed as pissed could be, but there's nothing you can do when the power's out, the power's out. And so we got the power up and running, and then we had to do that song like 30 times, folks. After not getting any sleep, I had to sit there and do that same song over and over again. But hey, that was a cool video, don't you think? Well, so we went skyrocketing from there. We went out on our Nash first national tour, and we traveled all around and had some incredible times. And folks, one of the best times of my life was on New Year's Eve, I think it was like maybe 85, 86, but we opened up for Huey Lewis in the News at the Oakland Coliseum and then headlined at the Catalyst. So we got at the Catalyst in the afternoon and set up all the gear and did a sound check, all jumped into this van and we drove up to the Oakland Coliseum and I don't know if you've ever worked there, but you go through this little underground passage there and there's piles of dirt from the rodeo and stuff and we all unloaded out there, and they had a pile of rental gear sitting in the corner, and we had to figure out what was what and set the shit up, and we did the show there, and oh man, what, how many people does the Coliseum hold? 17,000 screaming people, and ah, oh, what a fabulous night, and I was like just surrounded by beautiful girls laughing, having a grand time, and then we had to go run back into that van as soon as we were done, and drive back to Santa Cruz and we got out of the van into the Catalyst for a sold out show there and oh man I don't know if you guys remember the Catalyst back in the 80s but Roger and Mike and those guys there were incredible and we did so much partying up there in the plates oh my goodness my friends my friends I tell you so anyway here's a great clip from those days of Eddie and the Tide still that first album at the Catalyst check this out man oh so much fun
Well, we made it through the first album and our first tour, and we came back, and things were rolling along nicely, and we got money to go back into the recording studio, and they hired this producer from England who worked with Mike and the Mechanics and knew Tony Rutherford from Genesis, and he came in with his vision, and Eddie and him sat in a hotel room and wrote a bunch of songs uh, real quick, and... Uh, got approval from Atlantic Records, said, yeah, go, man, go spend money, go up in the studio and spend lots of money. So we went into the studio and we recorded this album and, uh, gosh, you know, it kind of sounded like a Genesis album. It was pretty deep and pretty trippy and uh, nobody was really happy with it and we were wondering what was going on. And then the super producer down there in L.A., uh, Mr. Foster, said, why don't you guys come down here? I got a song for you and come on down here and record that song and uh, check it out and we went down there and spent a week in the Hollywood Hotel on Sunset while the boys were in the studio recording this song and it was uh it's quite something and I remember specifically the manager Bobby Jr. coming in with a tape going well you gotta listen to this song it's what's going to be the next big hit and they put it into the radio and the little deck there and we listened to it and I was like huh not half bad and so uh, let's take a listen to this, and I'll tell you the story about that one. So uh, let's hear uh, Week in the Presence of Beauty.
Well, folks, you know what? It's kind of like, uh, it sure looks easy, but let me tell you the little stories behind this. First, there's a new keyboard player because the old keyboard player was too drunk and got everybody pissed off at every show. So they got rid of him, they got a new keyboard player. And then we went up there to Richmond where we did this at this old whaling facility that was falling down and crumbling around us. And it rained cats and dogs the first day. I mean, we were drenched in rain. And the next day was nice and sunny. So if you, I don't know if you recorded this, but if you play it back, you'll see clouds on one day and sun on the next day. But to make it look wet, they got hoses and sprayed everything down and got us all soaking wet, man. And we were like, ah, oh, shit, it's dry. Not anymore, it's not. And it was a whole nother day of sogginess out there in Richmond. But uh, yeah, what a great song. And it turns out, you know, we were thinking this was going to be our big hit. Well, old David Foster there went ahead and recorded the same song with a couple other people, like Alanis Morissette from uh, Britain, and she, her version ended up doing far, far, far better than our version did, but it was enough for the record company to say, well, go back into the studio and get rid of that Genesis album and come up with something a little more solid, a little more rocking. And so we did. We went back, and I actually had a chance to tune the drums for Vinnie Carmasi, the drummer from Heart at the time. And we uh, recorded this next album, uh, great stuff there. And uh, here we are thinking this is going to be great. We got some good stuff. So let's take a look at that first video from the second. Well, that was the first video. This is the second video from the second album that never actually made it to MTV. And I'll tell you the story behind that in a second. So let's watch that next clip. Waiting for the one, folks.
Well, folks, so we were really rocking. The new album came out. We were all super stoked. Then that original producer guy from England got a hold of it and goes, nah, folks, nah, that just ain't going to work. Uh, it's not my vision. This is not what I wanted. And if you guys release that stuff, I'm going to sue you. Well, guess what the record company said? We ain't really selling that many albums. And why do we want to get involved with that? And, you know, we'll just let this one get pulled off the shelves and we'll call it the end of the story for Eddie and the Tide. And that's pretty much what happened, folks. Right after that, uh, that video never made it to MTV. It ended up just being a YouTube classic, folks. And uh, it wasn't much further on after that that things started falling apart. We lost that record contract. They didn't give us a third album. We ended up doing an album on our own that sucked ass. And things just kind of crumbled. And it was one beautiful night in Napa. And I'm sitting there trying to write out the set list. And the opening band's crew smacked a Marshall cabinet upside my head. And I got pretty pissed off. And... I got home that night and I had three bounce checks from the management company sitting on my desk. I couldn't cash any of them. None of them were any good. And I just got hit upside the head with a cabinet and the manager calls and said, uh, you're not too happy. And I said, no, I ain't too happy, folks. And I bailed. I bailed at that point and it was probably the smartest thing I did because that ship did sink shortly thereafter. And it's such a shame. It's such a shame because it was a great bunch of guys with an incredible talent, horrible, horrible manager, Bobby Jr. I say that to you. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. You're an idiot. You destroyed that band. They could have been big time. But, uh, you know, what the hell? You know, uh, I was there on your 21st birthday when they put the hand in the cake. It wasn't me, but I saw it. Anyway, dude. So anyway, I want to leave you with some classic stuff. You know, here we go back to the Catalyst with Eddie and the Tide. And they're going to go ahead and wrap this up with my favorite song off that first album, Call My Name, because they really didn't do much after that. And uh, I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. And to Steve, Eddie Rice, Johnny, Chris Perry, George, Scott, Kaz, Chris, you know, I still love you guys. Take care. I wish you nothing but the best. And you folks out there in my audience, <coughs> enjoy this. And I'll talk to you next week. Good night now. And here's Eddie and the Tide. One, two, three.
Do you want to have dancing bones too? Well, it's very simple. Just visit the McClellan Wellness Center on Seabright Avenue in Santa Cruz. Give him a chance and he'll make your bones dance the night away. McClellan Wellness Center. Mountain Mike's Pizza, where the freshest ingredients and delicious toppings equal great pizza. With a full salad bar, a buffet table, and a fun, family-friendly atmosphere. We got game rooms for the kids, three big screen TVs. Mountain Mike's Pizza, located at 3715 Portola Drive. Oh. Oh. 